All right, we are live with Imran, Siddiqui, and Chubu, and Conti, and I'm Katie. I'm the Senior Marketing and Communications Strategist at CARE Washington, and we're here to talk about the hijab bans that have been happening in India and uh, protests that was held last Sunday and putting that in context. So my first question is, you were all at a protest this past Sunday in solidarity with these recent hijab bans in Karnataka, India. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that protest came about? Hi, so I'm Nisha, so uh, Hushbu, and um, yeah, the protest, it went on uh, really good because uh, uh, people showed up in hundreds, like there were almost 500 or more people who showed up. And the best part was that there were people from different groups, from different communities, like Sikhs, Dalits, Hindus, uh, Muslims, and Arab Muslims, not just Muslims from India, but Arab Muslims. So it was a diverse group and uh, we can see that everyone got affected and they wanted to stand in solidarity with uh, what happened in with the muslim girls in karnataka and the best part in the gathering was the youth the uh, there were lots of youth who showed up because this was regarding the education girls education so yeah it was it went on really well And Conti, I think you were um, involved in organizing the protest. Can you tell us about how, how you decided that it, it needed to happen in this past weekend? Um, sure. So uh, like Kushbo mentioned, um, while the issue uh, kind of uh, escalated around the ban of the hijab in the Indian state of Karnataka, um, this is also in the context of a series of uh, right-wing agenda of the Indian government, as well as its ideological uh, sponsor, the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, uh, which has been systematically othering marginalized people uh, in India. And uh, the hijab ban is, you know, particularly egregious because it goes after the marginalized in an extremely insidious manner, right? So, they, you know, it goes after the Muslim community, it goes after the women in the Muslim community, and it, you know, it is trying to uh, basically execute that marginalization by denying them education, mm. right? It, it is not just symbolic, but the execution is really, I mean, really, really egregious. I mean, who you know, in this day and age, who decides, you know, to outwardly deny a community education, right? And uh, so uh, that was when, you know, when, when Kushbu was talking, we were, you know, talking to a group of friends and uh, several of us came out and several of us felt that, you know, the denial of education in, you know, under the pretext of, you know, going after a religious identity and marginalizing people based on religious identity was, you know, I mean, it's, it's just unacceptable. Um, and just in case folks don't know, these, these bands that we're talking about are specifically towards um, like high school aged girls, is that right? Yeah, high school and um, undergrad. So, you know. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, these are in public colleges and public schools. So that's the, that's the outrageous part. That's horrifying. Um, Imran, can you talk a little bit about how it felt being at the protest and your connection to what we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, for, you know, first of all, I'm, uh, someone of, of Indian Muslim descent. My parents came to the United States um, in the mid 60s um, from India, originally from UP as well. And I still have family back there as well. So it hits close to home uh, for, for me and my family as well, just to see sort of this 
um, degradation of, of rights over the years and just this sharp rise in rhetoric really over the past 25 to 30 years um, in, in India. And as somebody who's worked on, you know, fighting against global Islamophobia throughout the years, whether it's um, what's exported here by our government, um, you know, in this global war on terror or how it's manifesting itself um, with other countries, you know, how like, you know, Israel treats Palestinians, for example, or how things are um, unfolding in France against, you know, Muslim immigrants as well, or how India is deploying uh, Islamophobia. It's, it's really just troubling to see. And I knew that we, uh, from a Care Washington perspective, needed to lend our voice to this cause as well. Um, and you really look at it, you know, as taking a step back and you talk about how tropes are used against Muslims and, and Muslim women historically. First of all, Muslim women are, are constantly being put on the front lines of, you know, being used as, as, a, as a tool by anti-Muslim forces and they're used to further Islamophobia. So the trope exists in places like, you know, Afghanistan and beyond that, you know, Muslims don't want to uh, educate their, their women. And so that's something that's cons consistently furthered um, in the greater narrative that's out there in, in these Islamophobic cultures. And so on one hand, you have, oh, Muslims don't like um, educating their women, but then when we actually want to go out there and get an education and be a part of these different societies, then these limits are being pushed um, by, you know, governments such as what's happening in India right now, where you're trying to prevent them, you know, something as, as sacred as, as wearing a headscarf and covering in Islam is it's non-negotiable for uh, many adherents of Islam. And so when you try to put a ban on that, it's definitely something that they're choosing between now their education and their, you know, trying to be upwardly mobile in society and, and their faith, which they hold dear to them. So for us, it, it's extremely troubling. And this is just emblematic. And in, in many ways, India is, is the most troubling spot on earth right now when it comes to, you know, the rise in fascism, not only, you know, in terms of Islamophobia, but how, you know, Sikhs are being marginalized, Dalits are being marginalized, and many other minority groups are being marginalized with 1.3 billion people in such a, you know, concentrated mass um, of land that can give rise to a lot of, you know, um, you know, atrocities taking place. So this is really a hot spot that we need to keep an eye on and lend our voice to. Now, on the issue of the actual protest itself, it was, you know, I'm newer to the Seattle metro area, but just to see like this outpouring of support from all facets of our community, multiple faiths, um, especially the youth coming out there and really being the leaders of this rally, just speaking up and, and showing just, you know, with their heart and their eloquence, how much this means to them. That was really amazing to see. And my hope is that people of conscience across, you know, not only the Seattle area, but beyond will really lend their voice to this movement. Yes, definitely. I love that you and Hushbu both mentioned the young people at the protest. Um, and Hushbu, what do you think you would most want people to know about how this issue affects you and your loved ones? It's, uh, first of all, like this uh, practicing of hijab, it's the most like sacred and innocent mm. practice of faith, right? And now when you will see this bizarre com comparison of hijab with the group of students which these right wings bagged up with, you know, a saffron shawl. So when we saw those videos and those pictures of saffron shawl goons, those uh, toxic male pride egoistic, like those uh, people, like uh, literally like they were uh, barging on girls, they were trying to push and pull out their hijabs. So, this was so scary for us, this video, because my family, my friends, they all live there. And uh, one of, like, not one, there were a couple of uh, my friends and some of some more who I met too, they, they belong to Karnataka. And they were so worried because it started in one region, Udipi, and it's, you know, it, within a week, it was just covering 
uh, 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 quite a lot region of within Karnataka. So in a week, we were just like, it, uh, we at first we thought, okay, it will stop here and the court will intervene. Uh, but the state gave, the, gave this decision that, you know, it compared hijab with that saffron shawl and now no students will be wearing religious identity. Mm. Uh, but uh, can you see the bizarre compa comparison, hijab with saffron shawl, but leaving rest of all the religious identities, which every day they are bringing into every places, out hijab and this uh, saffron shawl. So we are worried for our uh, cousins over there who they also wear hijab every day. How are they going to be treated in schools and colleges? Now, these goons, they will attack those girls just in the name of hijab because they are wearing hijab because they were heckled. They were heckled. They were pushed. The girls are pushed and not by these RSS backed groups, but by police authority. Police were uh, like using, uh, uh, they call, in India, we call it lati, which is a rod, a wooden rod, to disperse the Muslim girls and to send them back home because they were wearing hijab. So we were just sitting and crying over here because once these, you know, things are seen on social media, now, if, if, like they can start using this thing in other places in India too, because they know that police will be backing them. They will not be, you know, uh, stopped by the government, by the police, and they can do whatever they feel like. So yes, we were very scared and we were very shocked and we were shocked by the scale it was growing. And uh, when the when we heard the interim order from the uh, from the high court of karnataka that was even more painful because uh, in the court also it was compared the hijab was compared with the saffron shawl and for the time being they have, the court has ordered not to come to school with religious identity but religious identity shawl and saffron shawl and hijab rest of the identities are still being used they are still coming in whether it's you know the mangal suit were wore by the teachers or uh, the threads wore by the hindu students they tie threads in their hands or that um, you know after their puja they put some uh, kind of bindi on their head, they, show, they, they are showing up with that, but not the hijab. So where will our girls go then? Like they, they won't be allowed to enter the school because school show, doors are shut. So yeah, we, we were very scared and we are very worried for our friends and family over there. Yeah, the idea of police violence against girls who are trying to go to school is just horrifying. Um, I wanted to add one point to what Ashu was saying is that uh, in this case, it was the hijab, uh, and this is in the southern state of Karnataka, which is ruled by uh, the the BJP, which is in power at the at the federal level, uh, and in other states similarly, we have seen other you know similar othering practices against Dalits and Muslims. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a beef ban. Uh, there was a ban on religious conversion. And now this is the hijab. Uh, and all of these are following the same pattern, right? I mean, fundamentally, they are unconstitutional. We, everybody knows that when it does see the day of light at the Supreme Court, it will be tossed out. But everything stands in the way, right? The entire Mm -hmm. power structure that is maintained by the dominant uh, Brahminical caste or the, the, uh, the, the Brahminical class in India is that law and order is on their side. The, the elected machinery is on their side. The elected representatives are on their side. Uh, the courts are on their side. And it is egregious in this case that the government passed an order banning the hijab 
and the Karnataka High Court, which is, um, you know, it's like the state Supreme Court, uh, mm -hmm. upheld the order. And hmm. so there is no legal recourse at the state level. And then, you know, when a petition was submitted to the Supreme Court of India, they deferred it back saying that, no, let the state courts figure it out. This is a state matter because, you know, education is a state matter and we will think about it later. It's, you know, so every hassle that includes intimidation and uh, fear mongering and, you know, I mean, really systematic othering. It's like, school students are afraid to talk to each other because of you know it, it's you know it has such profound psychological trauma uh, it's you know sometimes we can't even begin to describe the extent of it yes yeah um Chiwu, did you want to add something yeah I, I just one more point my hijab is not you know a, a practice which i am doing uh, for one time I'm doing him for the other time I'm not like it, it right. whenever I go out go out I put my hijab and throughout the time I'm wearing the hijab I, uh, why I'm saying this because I, I've been I, I'm brought up uh, like I'm born and brought up in India how come this saffron shawl comes in picture with hijab because saffron shawl you're not wearing once you are out of the house to other you, they were being provided by a political party to these students because if you'll go and see the video all the students wearing the same saffron shawl same color same length brand new the girls who are wearing hijab it's the daily practice right so they were not being provided by a group of people to you know to do those jingoism in the name of religion mm. it's it's the very innocent practice of faith and don't interfere with that. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> Similar Thank you. to like how, you know, like anti-Muslim movements in the United States, you know, if you look at like the 2008 and onward time frame where you saw like all these anti-Sharia bills being introduced across the United States um, in 30 plus states, the narrative that, was trying to permeate those circles and in society was that Islam is not a religion, it's it's a uh, political ideology. And so trying to say, well, Islam is not protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution over here, it's a, it's a political ideology. So it's a process of dehumanization in order to um, marginalize and sideline a certain segment of the population. So now you see this being reciprocated in other countries such as India where, okay, like hijab is not uh, a tenet of faith, it is a political act. You know, it's, it's exactly like what these, you know, guys with the saffron shawls are, are wearing. It's not a religion. So you are not subject to the same protections within our constitution or society as these other religions. So you see how this is a contagion and, and it permeates different circles within society. You see this growth of, of this contagion here in the United States and how sort of this, um, you know, right-wing ideology, QAnon conspiracy theories, and so on and so forth have really manifested themselves in just the past few years alone. Um, you see in a place like Myanmar, where this type of ideology and dehumanization has taken place, and what has the world effectively been able to do once the Rohingya were pushed out of Myanmar, you know, uprooted from their villages where they've lived for over 100 years and ethnically cleansed, killed, raped, murdered in front of the world's eyes. Um, and basically, nobody had any type of recourse on a global scale to do anything. So the fear is that these are symptoms of what could potentially take place. Um, in the past few days alone, you have the BJP for India Instagram account openly like putting out an image of men in like it's a cartoon being lynched you know like being hung simultaneously with like you know muslim uh headpiece and in kurta pajamas and so on and so forth so really riling up the public um there was you know folks uh, openly saying uh something that was that was put out today that muslims should be treated as second class citizens and stripped of their voting rights so these are like symptoms of what can potentially 
you know, continue to snowball in a place where this ideology is being pushed forward. So there has to be some level of accountability and a global outcry in order to push back against this type of uh, hatred. Definitely. That is, it's so insidious and it, it, it just like everything you all are saying is, is there are so many places around the world where there's like so many similar, similar, um, I don't know, horrible, <laughs> horrific things happening. It really makes me think of like France too, where they're there. It's the same thing where they're saying like a hijab and a cross are like wearing a necklace are the same thing, which they just are, are not. And one can kind of be tucked under your shirt also, you know, it's just, it's a totally different situation. Um, but uh, it kind of leads me to, I wanted to end by talking a little bit about like why, which Imran was, was leaning towards, why this matters for us in Washington, like why it's important for us to be in solidarity with Muslim girls and women around the world. Um, and if, if something comes to mind, what folks could do if they are trying to be a part of this fight against global Islamophobia. So whoever wants to start with those. Okay, I think Washington. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, what? Like here also, we are a democratic country. We are living in a democratic country, and India is also a democratic country. It's a democratic, secular country. The difference which I'm noticing now is, we we have the constitutional rights over here. We have the freedom of. Uh, faith, like uh, whatever faith we want to practice, and there it's diminishing and it's diminishing day by day. To uh, like it's collapsing actually for uh, minorities class. We are not even able to pray properly during pray prayers. Prayers they just barge in and heckle. So we are a free country over here. We follow the constitution. We have the freedom of, we have the freedom to bring up our voice. So we have to use this platform. Uh, in America, we can uh, freely say what is happening wrong here or anywhere else. So that's why I think we can, you know, we, we have to raise up our voice over here. Otherwise, who, are, who is going to raise up? So it's our duty. It's our duty to raise up voice if something wrong is happening anywhere else. And that too, it's affecting my family, my friends over there. And I have got the right over here to uh, uh, express my concern. So I will be expressing my concern. And I really want, like, I, I, I want to go to our Congress people, to different representatives, and to uh, let them know, to make them aware of this rise in hate in India. Mm -hmm. And the broader picture of, you know, this uh, a Brahmanical society, this Hindutva society, which is rising uh, in such a large scale, it was always there. And, but now it's like, they are openly doing under BJP RSS regime. So we have to educate the, our representatives over here so that they can uh, you know see the growing concern back in India and take ac actions and speak to uh, on uh, uh, on the international level yeah definitely um, thank you I can add a little more to what Kushbu was saying a uh, couple of things uh, first is I wanted to provide a context as to why the Indian, it, why Indian Islamophobia is something that everybody should be paying attention to, uh, Muslims in America and everyone else in America, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, Muslims in the US, you know, are already hit by the, by the Western manufactured Islamophobia and with a really, you know, rising South Asian Indian American population, most of whom are the dominant caste Hindus who are ideologically aligned with the regime in India. Uh, this is something that is 
you know, very important to educate and unpack because the Indian version of Islamophobia is designed to ensure that more than 85% of the Indian population, which consists of the caste oppressed communities are distracted from asking the real questions about in, you know, in the case of the hijab ban, education, right? Mm -hmm. You know, public education is dismal. Uh, investment in education, investment in opportunity, investment in jobs, uh, you know, investment in social improvements. None of those things are, you know, it, it's basically, you know, a, a communal atmosphere is created so that the real questions are not being asked. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that whether it was prior Congress governments or the current uh, BJP government, they're all orchestrated the, the the sutradhar, as we call it, or you know, the person pulling the strings behind, uh, is the RSS. And the goal of the RSS is to establish what is called a Hindu Rashtra. And Hindu Rashtra stands for Hindu Nation. Uh, and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who is the father of the Indian Constitution, uh, you know, bitterly opposed their agenda. And I would like to quote what he said. Uh, you know, as, as a final statement on, on this point, um, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar warned us, and he says, if Hindu Rashtra does become a fact, it will no doubt be the greatest calamity for this country. No matter what the Hindus say, Hinduism is a menace to liberty, equality, and fraternity. On that account, it is incompatible with democracy, and hence, a Hindu Rashtra must be prevented at any cost. He was using the word uh, Hinduism for the benefit of the readers, uh, but what he really meant by the word Hinduism is the system of Brahmanism or the system built to maintain Brahmin supremacy because what comes out as the Hindu religion is basically what the dominant caste Brahmin who, who are the priests of Hindu society they are the ones who dictate what Indian society needs to look like. So um, I just wanted to call that out because, um, you know, I think here in the US, people do not understand uh, the, the real reason behind the manufacturing of, you know, why Indian Muslims are othered. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, it's, it's um, just in the same way that we, you know, for the for the purpose of, of trying to empower our community and to build up civil rights and, you know, fighting against oppression, we call it building power um, in, in a positive connotation. But at the same time, the forces that are trying to manifest sort of this fascist ideology, they're trying to build power simultaneously as well. And I don't think we really think about that, like in, in you know, vis-a-vis -vis, like issues of, of, you know, the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict, for example, it's very apparent and you see that manifesting itself within, you know, the rhetoric espoused by elected officials on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. You can sort of see where people's um, uh, loyalties lie on that specific issue and it's, it, there's a historic precedent for that. But when it comes to this type of ideology, it's, it's not as apparent um, in, in contemporary society, but you see uh, many people who have been elected to office who are um, in place in order to, if not manifest sort of this ideology or uphold power for um, the current regime in India, um, stay silent on any type of atrocities that are taking place. Uh, a few short years ago, the current prime minister of India was, it was banned from coming to the United States because he was associated with a group that was espousing this fascist ideology and communal violence and so on and so forth. This was as recent as the Obama administration. Now, um, during the Trump administration, they had like a Howdy Modi, um, you know, big stadium show for him in Houston, Texas with Trump, you know, showing up and sending a message. And there's this sort of marriage of the right wing in the United States to that right wing here as well. So I think it's something that we need to keep an eye on because when you have atrocities taking place in places like Kashmir, where they're 
um, autonomy and, and agency is, is threatened on a daily basis and an entire region is, is sort of taken over, people are not going to speak up amongst your elected officials if they're co-opted by sort of this right-wing ideology. So we, we need to also hold these elected officials accountable to speak up on human rights, um, you know, that are taking, you know, human rights violations that are taking place in the subcontinent as well, um, standing up on issues of global Islamophobia and so on and so forth. If there's folks who are in office right now who are espousing these viewpoints um, and, you know, blocking human rights, then we need to make sure that these people are not in office and that there needs to be folks that are, you know, more compatible with uh, freedom and freedom of, of thought and freedom of religion that are in place as well. So just wanted to add that. Absolutely. Imran, thank you so much for pointing that out because uh, one of the things that uh, is completely conjoined with that is that Indian Americans are the fastest growing power block in the US. Um, you know, we see them, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in tech companies, we see them in Wall Street firms, we, you know, uh, and in the past 10 years, we are seeing many, many, many more elected representatives from South Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and while most other folks in the US do not understand these nuances and, you know, they embrace multiculturalism openly, they want, you know, racial and cultural diversity, but we really need to be holding these folks, you know, I mean, to be able to declare their progressive values based on these measures. So for example, uh, uh, Imran, since you talked about elected representatives, uh, a really disappointing case was that of Congressman Raja Krishnamurti from Illinois, who is a Democrat uh, and is you know, very much aligned with the powers that be in India. So while he does expose progressive values on certain, certain topics, you know, the ones that, you know, really address the marginalization of Muslims in Kashmir or, you know, the marginalization of Indian Muslims in the rest of India. Uh, I'm just giving that as, as an example that, you know, there are many such elected officials at various levels, both in the Republican Party as well as the Dem Democratic Party. And we really need to kind of, you know, hold them accountable uh, for, you know, when, when they stand up to represent us. And I would like to add, uh, you know, one uh, recent uh, like example, recent in the sense it was during the CANRC event when we went for the city council talk. So one of my friend, she was there and her manager showed up in the opposite party and at first she she was like she she was like can i hide behind you i don't want her to see me right because that's how we are scared that in office now will not be treated the same way the will not be maybe able to get the projects which we uh, you know deserve to work on so she at first she hid herself and then she's like no why should I hide myself when I'm not doing anything wrong she's the one who is going wrong who is you know uh, 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 like going with this CANRC thing and where lakhs and lakhs of Muslims will be dislocated and will be thrown out of the country and will be you know sent to uh, uh, like will be snatched from their citizenship so sh she showed up but back, she said that till she remained in that project under that manager, she had to face the consequences. She had to face the, con it, it wasn't very openly because the she cannot do it very openly, but she, she could see that she was not getting treated the same way as other employees. And Sujata, if you can bring in, uh, like, so, uh, like one of my friends, she, she was like same way with Dalit community. Uh, like there, there was a case recently in California where now they are recognizing this thing that Dalits, that, that uh, it is uh, coming under uh, the, uh, 
uh, like uh, uh, certain types of uh, you know biasness which you show so th that particular thing has also been included that you cannot you know bias or be uh, 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 against any people uh, based on their caste system based on what caste they belong to Thank you all so much. Um, I think this has been like such a powerful conversation and I just wanted to recap a few of the things that um, you all have said in the past few minutes about um, Shu Wu saying it's our duty to raise our voices and educate our representatives and Conti saying that these bans distract from the real questions and they uphold the systems that are meant to maintain supremacy and Imran adding to that it's really important for us to build power because the other side is also building power and fascism is growing um, and that we have to hold our elected officials accountable. Um, so thank you all so much for this conversation and do you want to uh, let's have everybody close with with whatever whatever they want to close with, and then we'll turn off the streaming. Whoever wants to start. I'll just add, no, this was a great conversation. You know, um, I think we scratched the surface on so many topics here. So my hope is that we can continue to have some great conversations like this and um, I mean, the main thing is we don't want to wait for just another flashpoint to, to happen again. You know, we, we need to continue the momentum, um, you know, build strong power here within our local and state community and continue to, um, you know, challenge these these issues because they're not going anywhere just because they may not be making headlines uh, at the current moment. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not there it's happening to our brothers and sisters over there. So everybody needs to uh, know that global Islamophobia and the global fascist sort of um, orders is still taking place very strong and we need to continue to, to support organizations like all of the ones that are here on this call to ensure that we fight against that. Definitely. And then maybe we'll go to Conti and then end with Shibu. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, I'd again love to quote Dr. Ambedkar on, uh, on this issue where he said that, uh, you know, rights for the marginalized do not come by appealing to the the you know emotions or morals of the oppressor class but by yeah. constant struggle and his motto was educate organize agitate uh, so thank you for having me here and i really look forward to working with care washington and other organizations uh, at least in beginning to educate ourselves on these issues and you know the the structural and historical and the political you know context in which these things are happening in order to you know be able to mobilize and challenge them in a much more informed manner thank you for having me jai bhim that's that's the that's the slogan of the marginalized in india where bhim stands for dr bhim rao ambedkar uh, victory to him. That's what it means. Yeah, I also want to thank you for organizing this event. And uh, uh, it's not that just having one event and nothing, no action has been taken further on. We have to continue, as uh, was said, like we have to agitate and we have to, you know, uh, be in solidarity with uh, the hate which is rising in India. And uh, we, we, we have to uh, talk to our representatives and uh, ask them to take actions, uh, whatever they can to stop what is happening out there in this, uh, like in, in, in one of the biggest democratic country, right? India is one of the biggest democratic country and now we are seeing all the democracy being, you know, uh, one by one, it's diminishing, and uh, uh, our constitutional rights—it's uh, being not being upheld 
how it should be. So yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you, Katie. We'll we'll see you soon. That's good. Bye. Bye. Hey y'all.